It's a lecture series that we uh, have designed to, to complement the, uh, the freshman seminar, Augustine and Culture. And we hope that um, what we're creating is a means to share the richness and the complexity of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And beyond that, we hope that these lectures this year, organized around the theme of friendship and love, uh, will spark a desire in all of us uh, to learn something about those important dynamics, those important emotions. This morning, uh, Dr. Paul Dano, professor of uh, New Testament studies in our Department of Theology and Religious Studies, will give us his perspective on love in the Gospel of John. Barbara, was, Barbara Ball was here yesterday and describes this as an experience of a lifetime. She's not prone to superlatives, and so you should expect uh, just a really fine uh, presentation. It's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Dano. How can I not fall flat after that introduction? I don't know. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about love and friendship in John's Gospel. And I know that at least some of you have read John's Gospel or part of John's Gospel in the last year or so. Could I see hands of people who have done that? Oh, this is a much better turnout than I got yesterday. Very good. Uh, love and friendship is an important set of topics to deal with uh, because, with respect to John's Gospel, because in fact John's Gospel is the only one that deals with these two in relation to each other. And if you've read the Gospel in the last year or so, in our parts of it, you will be familiar with the fact that words love and friend show up in various places. However, we have a problem with all English translations of John's Gospel, which prevents us from getting a clear understanding of the relationship of love and friendship in the original text. And this is uh, what we're going to talk about today, love and friendship. You can see that Greek has a word, agapao. Anybody ever hear the word agape to describe love? Very good. Well, this is the noun right here in Greek, agape. So there's a verb to love, and then there's the concept, an abstract concept, love, and then there's the person whom you do this to, the loved person, and there's the adjective that describes the person whom you love. You notice that Greek uses the same words for what we would call nouns and adjectives in English. And the same thing goes over here. There's this other verb associated with friendship, and this is the, the noun, the abstract noun, friendship, and this is friend, and this is friendly. So they have, they use in Greek the same words for the nouns and the adjectives. But Greek, which is sort of loose with nouns and adjectives, does its complicated conceptual distinctions with verbs. So those two verbs up at the top become especially important for this study, phileo and agapao, the top words, the verbs. The problem is, is that English is a Germanic language, and we tend to concentrate our concepts and our fine distinctions in nouns. So if we go to the next page, you can see that we have difference for all of these words except for the verb to love. We translate the verb that's associated with agape, that kind of love, and we translate the verb that's associated with being a friend, both by love in English. So the distinction is lost in translation. You can just read a text in John and not know whether we're talking about agape, this agapao love, or the other verb. And that's why you have to get me in here to help you out, because if you don't read Greek, you can't tell which one is appearing in which context, okay? So as far as we go, the Greek does its heavy lifting with verbs, English does its heavy lifting with nouns, and the one place where we could get some help in trying to understand what's going on in Greek, the verbs, is the very place where we don't even have a verb in English, 
to distinguish. Okay? So, what are we going to do today? We're going to first look at what this kind of love is, then we're going to look at what this kind of love is, and then we're going to put them together. So, let's go to next page. Okay, what can we say about love, this agape love? Well, the preliminary observation, the first one is, love is a covenant option to... You've got to do this action of loving. Notice what John's Gospel says. I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, so you should love one another. And notice all of the love that comes up in the love commandment is the verb, the agape word. The agape word. So it's over and over. This is what you owe to God if you want to be in a covenant relationship with God. Now why is this so important? God created us to be in the right relationship with God and each other. And from day one, human beings have been messing that up. So God steps in and says, okay, look, I'm going to make it straightforward. Not easy, but straightforward for you people. If you want to be in the right relationship with me and each other, you've got to do this action of loving. <clears throat> Excuse me, this action of loving. You have to do this action. This is the obligation to be in the right relationship with me or with God. Okay? Now the problem is you say, oh, there goes God always putting obligations on us. Well, actually, this is the only obligation put on human beings in John's Gospel. This is all God is asking us to do. But you say, well, it's still an obligation that God's putting on us. Well, actually, yes and no. Love is an obligation that I place on myself. God doesn't enforce it, I do. How is that possible? Well, John's community is the one that gives us the statement, God is love. That's the only definition, one word definition of God in the New Testament. God is love. And if God is this type, and we still don't know exactly what it means, but, but if God is this type of love, and if God created all of us in God's image and likeness, then we are created to be loved in some sense. We are created to love. And so by loving, we actually do what we were built to do. And if when we don't love, when we choose not to do this action, we are actually going against our grain. And for those who do do it, we get to act as people in the image of God, and we are content and fulfilled because we are doing what we were built to do. So ultimately, the enforcement of this obligation is not God, God doesn't have to step in, step in and say, oh, you didn't do the love commandment, I'm going to get you. You get yourself. You mess yourself up. You harm yourself if you don't do this. And third, uh, love has a divine origin in, and is always of God. Listen to what Jesus, I mean, John's Gospel tells us. We love others I'm sorry, we love because God first loved us. Human beings don't start the chain of love rolling. It is God. All of us have experienced God's love, one way or another. And it's only when we recognize that, that we are able to pass it on. So we don't create the type of love God commands us to give or to do in the love commandment. It comes directly from God, and we pass it on. It's not our creation. Okay? As the Father loves me, so also I love you. This is another example of how it comes from God, but for Christians, we recognize that love can also come from God through Jesus. So God can love us directly, or God can love us through others, uh, specifically Jesus at this point. But 
we can experience this initial love that jump starts our ability to love from, directly from God or through Jesus, okay? Everybody okay? Any questions? Okay, we're going to the middle of the presentation. Next page. So what can we say about love? Definition. What is, it, what is this action that God commands us to do in the love commandment and that the way we are built inherently by nature demands that we do? It's a positive affective response. That's the first thing. The Greeks would not see this as an emotion. They would see this as, as some sort of an affective response. So I see another person or a situation and I recognize that there is something lacking there and my response is to want to help. That effective response. An effective response to and positive action for this positive action, it, it is guaranteed to be positive only if the love comes from God because it only does good from God's perspective. It only does good from God's perspective. And a good action for another that expects or requires no response from the other. This type of love has no expectation that the one who does it is going to get anything out of it, at least from the other. You do the good thing because it is necessary, you can do it, and it is right to do it. Now, this, this doesn't sound like there's a lot in it for me, this love that God requires, but let's go see what John's Gospel tells us. God so loved the world. Now the world here is the cosmos. All of created reality, you know, everything from people down to rocks. God so loved all of this created reality that God gave uh, his only son. Gave us his only son, okay? So God gave God's only son because God loved the world. What did God do? God looked at the world and said, what a mess. This whole thing, from the people down to the rocks, need help. And God responds by sending God's Son. This, this is the perfect way of addressing this terrible situation the world finds in it, itself in. So God sends God's Son. Notice, God doesn't send God's Son with the guarantee that any human being is going to respond positively. God does it because God sees that the world needs something and that God knows that God's Son can do something good for the world and God sends God's Son to, take, to act to do something good for the world. It's not about what God's going to get out of it and it's not about how worthwhile the world is. God created it, yes, so it's got worth, but I mean, compared to God, it's not really all that significant and yet, because God is God, God sees that God can do good for this world that needs it, and God does it without expecting a return. And if we want to be in a relationship with God, we've got to act the exact same way towards each other. We see a need, we act on it, and we expect nothing back from the other for ourselves. We do it because it's right. We do it because John's Gospel is concerned about how do you become a child of God? Well, John's answer is you become a child of God in one sense by acting like Dad. Okay? You do it because this is what God does and it's what we were built to do, what we were designed to do, what we are created to do. Okay? Notice, the father loves the son, so the father looks at the son and says, oh, what can I do for the son? And has given everything over to him. So God says, the best thing I can do for the world is to give him my son, but if I'm going to give him my son, I'm going to have to give him everything he needs to do a great job, so you equip. So again, God does good, both for Jesus and the world here. God does good 
And, but God doesn't say, I'm going to take it all back if you all don't respond. God does it, and it lets what happened, what happens, happen. Okay? So notice, what can we say about these three parts of the definition? A positive, effective response. The New Testament frequently, most frequently, calls this compassion or mercy. It's looking at a situation being moved with compassion or mercy or pity and saying, this situation can be improved by doing good, and as far as I know, this is how to do it, and I'm going to do it. It doesn't it's not predicated on whether or not the person I do this for, or the people I do this for, are happy with me, thank me, or anything like that. I do it because it's right. And notice the examples from the New Testament. Now these are from all the Gospels, not just John. What's this love about? The positive action I do is that I feed, what's the, what's the situation? Hungry. The people are hungry. So if I see hungry people, I go, that's not a good thing for human beings to be hungry. Feed them. If a person's sick, you heal them, or you try. If a person is weak, you defend that person. This is an example from the New Testament. Um, if a person is indebted to you, you forgive it. The, the sin of the debt, you forgive it. If a person is uneducated, you teach them. If a person is uh, my enemy, what am I allowed to do to my enemies according to the love commandment? Good, only good. If my enemy is hungry, I feed my enemy. Oh, that's a crazy idea, Dano. If you do that, they're just going to get strong enough to come back and get you. Maybe. But that's, that's not a consideration. You can only do good. You cannot do evil. Period. And uh, what do you do for your oppressors? Well, you pray for them. You don't pray just for your friends, you pray, and family, you pray for your oppressors. You can only do good for others. Now this seems ridiculous. This is not a, a, a sound way to develop foreign policy, for example. You do nice things for the people who are opposed. Well, let me tell you, God is really bad for foreign policy. Because God treats us who are in sin, and all of us have sinned, and are therefore, by definition, enemies of God, God only does good for us, and probably being God has a bigger clue than I have, knowing that many of us are just going to turn around and, and, and uh, do, some, do more evil. But the thing is, is that God only does good for us, and we are called to do only good for each other, period. And when we do that, we are functioning as designed, we are doing what God made us to do, and according to John's Gospel, we begin to experience the life of God, God's self, God's own life, inside of us. And even though we don't do this to get that experience, getting it is very nice. Because finally we are living the life God designed us to live. And if we don't follow this love commandment, if we don't do good for others, then we reject God's offer of this life we were designed to experience. And we are never what we were created to be. Ultimately, we are failures from every perspective. And John, John's Gospel, is very strong in this point. And if we don't start living the life of God now, we never will. According to John's Gospel, if I am not doing the love commandment, and if I don't love others, when I die, I'm gone. There's nothing left of me. I'm called to share the life by doing what God does, if I do not do this, there's nothing left at the end. So we can reuse my social security number because I'm not there when my body dies. It's all gone. It's all over. Okay? Now, any questions before we move on? It's a question in there. Uh, yeah? Um, can you say just a little bit more about what the difference is between a 
a positive <coughs> response and an emotion or a feeling? Well, the Greeks would consider emotions, emotions would come out of the gut. So they would, they separated, we might think of all these things as emotions. The Greeks separated emotions which were usually strong, like love, uh, well, not love, hate, lust, um, all, uh, even erotic kinds of attractions, they would locate down here and they would call those emotions. Eff um, affectedness was where, where you did your thinking, which for the Greeks was here. Yeah, they thought here and felt here. We sort of moved everything up a notch. We now feel with our heart, please, with our head. But, but um, the positive affect of, e of compassion or mercy is not an emotion to them. Uh, as it might be for us, uh, because an emotion can only be elicited from a personal relationship with another, and affect can be elicited from another human being with whom I do not have a personal relationship. So it's the difference between seeing the terrible suffering of people in a drought in some country on TV and knowing somebody in that drought. In one case, we would, today, I guess we would think of that as more as a, a, an informed intellect. They would see that as, um, as something kind of similar, but it would not be an emotion, because you would have to have a personal connection for an emotion. So I could be upset because somebody stole my car. I can have an emotional response to that, but technically I can't be emotionally responsive to somebody stealing your car if I don't know you. I can just say, oh, that's terrible, or that's awful, but it's the difference between what makes you cry and what makes you concerned. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? You mentioned foreign policy. How do you, like, you obviously have to compromise some of those positive actions. According to the New Testament, no. You have to live with the consequences. But, like, like today's foreign policy, how would you justify that? Like, is it possible? Well, the question is, or, uh, what, where, the question is going to be with the next word, so I'll have to develop this more with the next word. Okay. Um, where do you put your, where do you put, where do you invest yourself? If you are investing yourself in the a particular political system, then you are going to do the equivalent of the love commandment for that. You're going to do whatever it takes to keep that system going. The question, that what John's Gospel would say is, if it's not the right thing from God's perspective, then you won't be there to enjoy it because you don't get the love of God for investing in anything except God and doing the love commandment. Uh, I, I frequently tell my classes when I teach, uh, one thing that always makes me laugh is when somebody comes on TV and says this is a Christian country. Because if we listened to what Jesus said, it would be so radically different from what it is now. It might not be prudent, but it would be doing God's will. And as we see, God's will and good politics frequently don't match. I mean. God's son did God's will, and how was he treated in the political sphere? And what's the message for Christians? Don't expect any different. So, uh, it might seem simplistic, or it might be profound, and we make it simplistic to keep it from being so challenging. And it's not easy. We have a whole ethics co concentration with faculty saying, well, what do we do? You know, we live in a real world, and the answer is, well, whatever real world we live in, it's not God's world until. So it's, it's not simple, but it's, it can't be argued away. We have to live with what Jesus said. Okay? Anything else before we move on? I don't see anybody. Do you see anybody? Okay. Okay, next, let's get up to, to phileo. Ah, here we come. Now, this is, this is where we're going to put phileo and agapao in, in tension with each other. Preliminary uh, uh, considerations. This is about that other, this is the friendship half, the phileo. It's in Philadelphia. You know, 
uh, as, as the name indicates. We all get along in Philadelphia, right? Well, not if you watch the news, but that's the, that's the hope. Friendship love is discretionary and conditional. You, you have to love every other human being, as well as the rocks and plants and everything else, according to the love commandment. You only have friendship love with a few individuals. You would be an emotional wreck if you tried to be everybody's friends. I'm sure that there's a psychological condition for that, uh, for that type of a person. Friendship love is discretionary, and it is conditional. Notice what John's Gospel says. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And if you don't, you're not his friends, period. Notice also that friendship love, the condition, is based on what the other person does. Okay? Friendship love is of human or of divine origin and is restricted to equals. I can only be friends with somebody with whom I share a critical mass of commonalities. So, uh, I can be friends with other faculty at the school. I can, only, in a Greek sense, I can only have the analogy of a friendship with students. You know, you can't be too friendly with students. We're different. Today in America, everybody wants to be everybody's friend, so we have to get that idea out of our heads. This was a very structured, class society. There were slaves, free people, and Romans. The only time. Romans talk to free people or slaves was to give orders and to hear yes. The only time free people talk to slaves was to give reports or give orders. You can only be friends in this society with people with whom you share a critical mass of common characteristics. It's still like that, though. You have to have certain commonalities. Now, friendship can work across different sets of commonalities. Uh, I share with some of my friends a love for really cheesy sci-fi movies, and we get together, and the expectation is, is that we're going to look at those and have fun with that. But I can have another group of friends that are really interested in politics, and, and the precondition there is that they better agree with my ideas on major things. Or at least enough of them so that we don't end up killing each other, fighting about them, right? So there's all kinds of friendship groups, but it's always conditioned on what the other person is doing. And it's, it's, it's that we have to have something in common. You know, uh, I might teach in the theology department, the Pope is not my friend and vice versa. I mean, we're sort of disparate. He's running a worldwide organization and has all sorts of concerns, and I have to get the papers corrected and prepare lesson plans. We're not, we're not running in the same circles, okay? That doesn't mean he's my enemy, it just means we're not that, we don't have that much in common. Okay. Friendship love is of human or divine origin. If it's of human origin, it can be either good or bad. If it's of divine origin, it's always good. Okay? And it's restricted to equals. Notice that for Jesus, Jesus can say, our friend Lazarus is asleep, so Jesus can have human friends. They share common goals and ideals, as we saw. It's probably that Lazarus keeps the love commandment. This makes, Jesus, uh, his, uh, makes Lazarus Jesus' friend. For the Father, God, loves his son, Jesus. John's Gospel introduces very clearly an idea implicit in the other Gospels. God and Jesus are on the same level because they're both divine. In fact, the only friend God has is Jesus in John's Gospel. And Jesus is also human. So Jesus can have human friends, and we, are, we already know the pre prerequisite, you've got to do the love commandment. And according to John's Gospel, God can't be my friend or vice versa except under one specific condition. Just based on what we've said so far today, what's the one way I can be related to God in a friendship relationship? What? And what is the something we have in common? Love. Love. 
It's love, yes. What we have in common, though, is Jesus. The best we can get in the New Testament is to be a friend of a friend. God's friend is Jesus. Jesus is my friend. So, uh, you know, a friend of a friend. God comes to parties through Jesus. It's not that you invite God to rest. Okay? God might love you directly, but the parties are out until Jesus is invited. Okay. So, um, so, human friendship may be the positive or negative from God's perspective. Notice it says, um, if you, Pilate, release Jesus, you, Pilate, are not a friend of Caesar for everyone who makes himself, uh, what happened, uh, a king opposes Caesar. So notice, friendship is based on what the other person does. If Pilate wants to be a friend of Caesar in the sense that they're both in the same administration, although they're not going to go to the same dinner parties together. Caesar, well, I don't know who Caesar eats with, and there's nobody equal to Caesar in Rome and Park. But at least they can be friends in this governmental sense. You are not a friend of Caesar if you make yourself a king. Jesus' actions should exclude Pilate from um, releasing Jesus if Pilate wants to be Caesar's friend. So Pilate has to make a choice. Am I going to side with Caesar or with what's right? You see how this comes in. And he chooses to side with Caesar because Caesar pays his salary. I don't know what uh, good it did him because if, if he didn't shape up by the time he died, there wouldn't be any place to enjoy the salary, ultimately. But the thing is, is that you, you do good for your friends, and you really don't care about who else suffers in, in a human friendship relationship. Thieves get along great together, right? They might even divide up the city into districts so you can go rob and not accidentally step on one of your buds, who's also a thief. Friendship is, is always, in that sense, reciprocal. I like you because I want you to be my friend because you do what I like, which probably means that I do it too. And then we have a friendship that makes people who don't do what we do undesirable. And as opposed to the love commandment, if I don't like what you do, I can stop you with, from a friendship point of view. So gangs, that's a perfect example of a friendship group, right? We get together and we kick butt of everybody we don't agree with who tries to come in on our territory. That doesn't mean that that's good, though. Is that the loving thing to do according to the love commandment? So human beings, we have to be very careful because when we start acting on our own in our friendship relationships, we can get ourselves in deep holes. We need some kind of guiding principle to keep it from degenerating into something <coughs> destructive. Have we finished this one? I think so. Yeah, yeah let's, go to, let's, let's start to wrap this up. Okay. So the definition of this friendship kind of love, it's reciprocal. If I'm a friend of people who do what I like, then probably those are the same people who like what I do. It's a reciprocal thing. It also has exits. I'm not going to be your friend if I can't count on you. Did you ever have the experience of somebody really wanting to be the friend of somebody else and that somebody else wasn't interested? That's not friendship, that's stalking, right? <laughs> it's gotta be mutual and reciprocal or it gets to be really scary. So it's gotta be a reciprocal relationship. It's emotional response to another based on his or her actions. If you, you know, if we're, if we're part of uh, the, 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 I don't know, it's so hard today because it's hard to know what, what's going on, but let's say we're all part of the progressive workers party and we hang out with each other and we watch movies together and we cheer at the same part of, part of documentaries and all this stuff, and you start acting differently you're going to end up being out of that group of friends, right? If you start thinking, no, 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 we need to have uh, more free trade or something, as opposed to the workers' progressive part, then you're going to have to deal, then you're going to end up not being the friend of others, and they are not going to be your friends, based on 
preferred actions. So the sisters, notice what, what John says, so the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Master, the one you love, this is phileo, friendship love, is ill. Now notice that in this story, it starts off by saying Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. That's love commandment love. Of course he does. He's required. That's the basic bottom line if you're going to be in a relationship with God. But the only one of those three he's friends with is Lazarus. He's got something in common with Lazarus. This is a culture in which women are locked away. You can't be friends with women unless you're blood relatives to them or they're your spouse. But you don't, you're not friends with other women. So he's, he's only friends with one of them. And according to what he told us, that's because Lazarus does the love commandment and they hang out and talk about doing the love commandment or whatever it is you do if you're Jesus' friend. Okay. And Jesus wept, so the Jews said, see how he loved phileo, this is the phileo word, see how much he was his friend. He loved him like a friend. Notice, you don't cry about uh, doing the love commandment and it, something goes wrong, but with friendship, since you're, it's reciprocal and you're mutually involved with expectations and you are emotionally involved, Problems of friendship cause tears. <coughs> they, they cause emotional anguish. So here are some New Testament examples. If I have a sick friend, what's the expectation with friends? Healthy friends take care of sick friends, right? So if I'm sick today, you'll take care of me if you're my friend. And then the expectation is also that if tomorrow you're sick and I'm well, I will take care of you. It's reciprocal. You've got to be fulfilled. If you don't fulfill them, you are not my friend. And if I don't do them, I am not your friend. So, um, so these are examples that come in the New Testament. A healthy friend, the emotional response is sadness, concern, worry. And what do you do? You help. If you can, you mourn if they don't. Okay? A uh, groom and a best man. What's the emotional response? The best man is really thrilled for the, for the groom. What's the expectation? Well, you're going to do the same for me when I get married, right? But it's to rejoice together. It's, it's a reciprocal emotional response with expectations. Same thing with... Um, Spouses, what is the proper relationship between spouses who happen to be in a loving friendship relationship? Respect. And people, this was crazy in the first century. The idea that men should respect women. I mean, they were property after all. And Jesus says, no, respect is part of that relationship. The goal is to be friends with your wife, you know, and, and for wives to be friends with their husbands. But notice also that the world or evil people, now this ran over the edge, the world or evil people, they, they have loathing for their enemies. Those people who belong to God, Jesus says this, you know, the world wouldn't hate you if you belong to the world. So human friendship, Instead of being like divine love, which only does good for others, even your enemies, you only do good for your friends. You're not expected to do good for your enemies. So let's round it up, and then we can have a couple minutes to talk, hopefully. What is the comparison between agape love and phileo love? Agape love is necessary or obligatory, whereas phileo love is discretionary and voluntary. The response is effective, non-emotional, but emotional when it comes to phileo. Um, it's unconditional with the love commandment love. It is always conditional in that it expects a specific response or a specific responding action. Agapic love is directed to all people. This phileo, this philia love is uh, you do good um, for some people. And it's reciprocal. You only do good with agape, with agapao. You do good for friends and you can do evil against enemies. We can, we can 
make ourselves stronger either by building ourselves up or tearing down others. Um, agape love can be between equals. I can have it for one another, love one another, but it also goes up and down between God and human beings. As opposed to phileo, which can only be between people who are somehow equal. You know, you're just not going to be friends with certain people. It's a hard realization. Just, just because of the difference in station. Okay. So what's the ideal relationship between love and friendship in John's Gospel? I think it's in this sentence. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus says that. And then, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What is Jesus saying here? Love is great. It's of God. It's what we were built to do. But friendship is also really neat, and it's part of being a human being. The only way you can pull these two together in a way that is healthy and productive, that helps you to do what you were designed to do, is if your friends are those who do the love command. And if you are one who does the love command. Anything besides that is going to involve you in ultimately breaking the love command. Because friendship will always do good for friends, and even if it means hurting somebody else. Unless there's a higher order principle, like the love command is stepping in and saying, no, you can only do good. Okay. So, the thesis is ideal friends, um, the ideal friendship love is the positive emotional response to another um, based on the good actions according to the love command. The only way human friendship can contribute to being in your positive relationship with God is if the people you are friends with and the people who are friends with you are people who do the love command. All because only in this way will you be sure not to break the love commandment. Because you will always do what's right for people. The result is also going to be that your friends are going to be the kind of friends you really want in the long run instead of the short run. They're going to be the type of people who are going to do good for you even if it's uncomfortable for you. They are the people who are going to intervene if you have a, drunk or, a drug or alcohol problem. Because that's the right thing to do for you. And it's going to demand that you make hard choices by doing hard things for others. But, if you can, but you can always trust those people because they're never going to harm you. They're never going to choose to do something to you that is destructive of you. It will always be to your good that they're looking. Even if it's possible, Jesus is the perfect friend because he will only do the right thing towards you. And he will never do anything to harm you or destroy your relationship with God. He will never ask you to put God second to anything else. Okay? Any questions, comments? We've got about seven or six minutes. And you're certainly going to get out of time to go to your next class. So please, if you have any questions, comments, clarifications, Yes. Um, is that you, as you say, um, humans are in, like, built to love. So, like, why, why do we clearly, clearly say, um, see that, like, the world, the entire world is having problems with this? Jesus, well, if you just read John's Gospel, it's stated pretty simply, but this is what it says. It says, human beings prefer the glory of the world to the glory of God. In other words, if you do the love commandment, are you ever going to be on a billboard? No. Are you ever, are you, you're not going to be a household name. You're going to be doing good for each other. We, we, uh, we give celebrity status to bad people. You know, they don't have to be terrible, just naughty people. And, and what happens is, is that he says, we prefer the glory of human beings to the glory of God. That's the way John explains it. We choose to be, to be more powerful than we need to be, thereby depriving other people of their rightful power. We choose to be richer 
then we need to be thereby depriving other people of the basic necessities of life. We always want to aggrandize ourselves, and doing, we disrupt that relationship with God and other human beings. And the only way to put it right is to start only doing good for each other. So, I mean, why is there sin? Uh, trust me, there are more books in that library about that question than there are students in here. But ultimately, it comes down to human beings not doing what they were created to do. We were created to reflect God, not be God. <coughs> we were created to pass on God's love, not manufacture our own, and come up with something perverted. But we, we, I guess we have this uh, self-aggrandizing urge among us, at least some of us do. And as St. Augustine points out, even though he's much later than this, all you need is a, a few people doing that, and it takes down the whole group. You know, you only need one guy who's power hungry to destroy a complete functioning organization, right? Okay. Anything else? Oh, I thought you were going to tell me how clear I was. No more questions. Yes? Um, is it ever... Is it ever a bad thing to let a friend go uh, when you're talking about the ideal kind of uh, friendship love? Oh, it's 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 well. Th does God let us go at certain points? In, in the sense that God says, uh, if you really have to go out there and do something stupid, we've told you everything we can. We've given you the instruction, and then let you go. That kind of letting go. Yeah, because you, you what what are you going to do? Break the person's legs? There comes a point where his his or her ability to act freely and discover the truth has to be the, the good that we give that person. Now, if they have an Uzi in their hands, that's a different story. We don't have the right to, to uh, equip people to do something destructive. But if the person goes out and says, well, I'm going to give up my college career and go see green basket weaving is all about and find happiness there, eventually you have to step back and say, okay, but I can't follow you there. I have, I have other things to do here. You have to be willing to let people go because God respects us enough to let us go. And, and I guess, I don't know, John's gospel doesn't say it, but God must also hope as much as we do that certain people come back. Except in God's case, it won't be all people. Um, did that answer it? Sorry? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Anything else? Uh, yes. This may be kind of a huge topic that you don't want to touch, but at the very end of John's Gospel where Peter and John, uh, Peter and Jesus are talking and that Agapo Pileo kind of words go back and forth. They kind yeah. of look around. I mean, it seems to be that the distinction you're making seems to maybe not be as clear. Oh, I think it's it's brilliantly clear there. So, so okay. how much time do I have? That's that going to help me just understand better. I have a minute. After 60 seconds, anybody who's not interested can go. But the thing is, is that... Peter has destroyed the friendship with Jesus, hasn't he? By denying Jesus three times. But he comes up to Peter and he says, do you do the love commandment? Do you love me? And Peter says, oh, I'm your friend. And Jesus says, but wait, wait, or do you love me? Are you willing to do the right thing for others and for me? And Peter says, I'm your friend. It's only the third time that he undoes the destruction of the friendship okay, well then, are you really my friend? So you see, you can't stop, you can't disrupt the love commandment by losing a friend. But if you deny somebody three times, you do lose a friend. So he has to go through a process of rehabilitation before he can be Jesus' friend again. But he's required to do the love commandment at every minute. So I think if we had more than 40 seconds, it's really a powerful uh, discussion of the distinction between the two and how they come together. At the end, Peter has already affirmed that he's going to do the love commandment, and now he can be Jesus' friend again. Okay? Well, I'm sorry that we didn't have more time or more questions, but thank you, and good luck with your semester.